welcome. We had a little bit of entertainment beforehand, uh, get you thinking about Taiwan and writing about Taiwan. Uh, my name is Sherilyn Parsons, and I'm the founder and director of the Bay Area Book Festival. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I was interested in this panel in particular, moderating, um, because I love to travel so much. And books were one of the ways that I began to explore the world when I was a little kid. Um, I loved books that were set in foreign places, and often I then went to those places. And some of them um, had beautiful names, actually. Madagascar, Formosa which of course is the old name of Taiwan, Kathmandu. So books really do inspire you to travel. And this panel is all about one particular place and writings from that place and of that place. So what I'd like to do is introduce each of the panelists and have them read a short passage, I'm talking just a couple of minutes, to give you a sense of their writing and um, a little taste of Taiwan to start out. So Ed, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, and Ed's book is, oh, I forgot to tell everybody, turn off your cell phones, by the way, if you haven't already. Yeah, or at least the sound of the cell phones. You have an amusing ringtone. Unless you what? Unless you have an amusing ringtone. Yeah, amusing ringtones are OK. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, exactly, exactly. So Ed is a mystery writer, and he wrote this book, Ghost Month, which is like, really fun. I read it. It gives you this, the whole mystery takes place during this famous month called Ghost Months, which maybe you can tell us about um, a little bit more, but it's just got this wonderful exotic flavor to it. And um, do you want to read a little bit, Ed? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks so much for coming out Saturday morning and all. Um, well, wait a second. I have a feeling that quite a number of you already know a lot about Taiwan. Is this true? <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of you already know what Ghost Month is, don't you? There are no's. There, yes are. there are some no's. Well, Ghost Month is, is the, basically the seventh uh, lunar month. It's, it's when uh, th there's a Taoist belief and a Buddhist belief that the doors to the underworld open and uh, the spirits are free to walk the island. Um, there are a number of things that you can't do or that are frowned upon during Ghost Month. You can't make big capital purchases. You can't buy a house because the spirits will think the, the house is for them. You can't buy a car because the spirits will possess the car. You can't whistle at night because otherwise spirits will follow you. You can't hang your clothes out to dry because then they'll you know, become occupied by spectral uh, people putting on your clothes. Um, you should avoid water, uh, and uh, you should definitely not die during Ghost Month, <laughs> because then your spirit will be lost amongst uh, more angry spirits and stuff. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to be re reading a section from, uh, from the sequel to Ghost Month, which is coming out this fall. Um, and uh, the protagonist returns. His name is Jing Nan. Uh, and actually, that, that's my name. I, I gave him my name. I just made it really personal. Um, so in, in this section, uh, Jing Nan is having a dream. I stood before an offering table that was adorned with burning incense, plates of fruit, and a bunch of other sacred objects I've never understood the purpose of. Smoke from the joss obscured everything beyond the table, but I could feel that my old classmate, Guo, was near. When he was alive, I used to refer to him by his childhood nickname, Cookie Monster. Jingnan, he asked, is that really you? Yes, it is, I said. Where am I? You're standing at one of the doorways between the world of the living and the courts. What are the courts? I'm being judged and punished for all the wrong I've done in my life. He had made some mistakes in life. One of the last ones had been pointing a gun at me. Jingnan, the gods here are all mainlanders. <laughs> and they're really loud and mean. I'm sorry you're having a hard time, Gua, but why are we talking? I have to apologize for trying to kill you. I'm very sorry. It's all right. You have to say that you forgive me or it doesn't count. Okay, 
I forgive you. Thank you, Jing Nan. Please allow me to apologize to you 9,999 more times. <laughs> what? 10,000 times every day for the next 10,000 years. I'll be dead by then, Gua. That doesn't matter. All the dead are apologizing to each other as we try to work our way out of this maze. I forgive you to infinity, I said. Please consider this matter closed. Thanks. <laughs> All right, next up is Joshua Samuel Brown, and he has this really fun book called um, Vignettes of Taiwan. He moved to Taiwan, how old were you? I was young, I was 24. 24, and stayed? I was very immature, I was very And stayed for how many years? On and off for about 12 to 15 years. Okay. I count. I kept coming and going and yeah. being called back. And started, and was teaching English. And teaching English yeah, illegally yeah. at schools, teaching children, not right. adults. And, and so now writes like obsessively about Taiwan. I write obsessively about Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> that he does. Uh, I've written this is an obsessive person. Anyway, I will, slightly. <laughs> I will let you read Hi. a section. Yeah, thank um, you. So first... Um, I'd like to point out that the place that I'm writing about is the Sherlin Night Market, uh, which I wrote this story 10 years ago when it was still kind of cool. And now if you're going to come with me to Taiwan, I'm going to take you to a much better night market than this because it, it's kind of, as they say in, in Taiwan, lao diao ya. It's sort of uh, corny. It's, uh, it's old hat now. There are much better places for me to take you. And this story is called Death by Cholesterol. <clears throat> Suicide in this primarily Buddhist nation is frowned upon. However, should the horrible futility of life be weighing ever heavier upon your soul, there exists one surefire way to ensure a painless, delicious demise. Death by cholesterol at the Sherlin Night Market. As assisted suicide is illegal in Taiwan, I will couch my advice to you, my terminally depressed friend, in negative terms, advising readers inclined to continue living to stick to the lighter fare being peddled on the market's outer spokes, fried pastries, duck wings, squid on a stick, and other slow-killing delicacies, and not make their way to the enclosed food court that forms the Shilin Night Market's greasy innards. For starters, do not order, as an appetizer, three famous Taiwanese oyster pancakes, delicious fresh oysters folded into a pure egg batter and fried in lard. Following this, do not go to one of the chou tofu stalls and get yourself a few orders of deep-fried fermented tofu served with a heaping helping of pickled vegetables and hot sauce. Finally, under no circumstances should you order a plate of Taiwanese beefsteak. This meal, which consists of a huge slab of grade D beef fried in lard on a hot plate, slathered in gravy and served with a side of greasy spaghetti and a raw egg cracked on top, <laughs> will almost certainly kill you. Should Dame Fate decide that your ticket is not yet up and somehow give your tormented cardiovascular system the strength to pump out the pounds of grease which you, in your melancholic stupor, pumped in there, take this as a sign from the gods that your time is not as yet nigh. Under no circumstances should you attempt to finish the job by consuming half a dozen da ping bao xiao bing, big cake wrapped around little cake. <laughs> the fried delight, a Sherlin specialty, should be enough to help you pull the plug for good. If not, cheer up. There'll always be another night. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of food stuff written about Taiwan. We're going to talk more about that. I forgot to mention that Joshua has written a few Lonely Planet guides to Taiwan. So he is definitely one that you could ask questions about uh, and please traveling yeah when he says he'll take you someplace he really means it I, I may literally yeah. take a few of you with me to <laughs> yeah. Taiwan after this yeah is over, if you're so. interested you know who to talk to okay so Shauna Shauna Yang Ryan has this gorgeous book called Green Island and um, it sweeps you through uh, Taiwanese history in the 20th century early 21st century and it's also set partly in Berkeley Main character lived uh, in in uh, Taiwan and then came over here. 
Um, and I just love this book. I listen to it part on audio, actually. It's a really beautiful audio recording. And then, of course, reading the, the book itself um, was gorgeous. So can you share a passage with us? Um, I wish I had something funny to read, but it's a little bit <laughs> serious. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to read something that um, was a little bit descriptive of Taiwan. So this scene is later in the book, and unfortunately uh, the, the main character is quarantined in a hospital because of SARS with her father, um, and they're, they're looking over the city. Um, I washed his shirt in the bathroom, and when I came out, I found him at the window in his undershirt, his bare shoulder pressed to the glass, this short, thin, old stranger whose body my father, enigmatic, overwhelming, fearsome, somehow occupied. The compassion that I suddenly felt for him surprised me. I joined him at the window, trying to understand what he saw. Buildings, the haphazard jumble that betrayed the city's turbulent history, obscured the horizon, but I imagined I saw the curve of the earth, a smash of life gradually thinning out at the edges, sprinkled into the dark green hills, empty to the sea, an island shaped like a yam or perhaps a leaf of tobacco, with a black spine of dark mountains and knobby strings of twinkling lights cascading down the edges. I feel like I've been thinking about death my whole life, Baba said. I didn't know what to say. I thought your mother would live forever. She was always going to outlive me. His eyes, blue with age, sparkled in the sun's glare. I tried to think beyond my own meager personal memories to something more primal, a planet amid deep black space, still cooling from whatever blast or collision or universal hand that has created it. This planet is not just a lump of dumb rock. It is alive. It moves, shakes, slides. Two plates collide. Four million years ago, two plates collide and an island erupts. This island. Our lives were so minuscule in comparison. Thank you. Um, so the last uh, author speaking has written a gorgeous book called Letters, Letter, Letter from Taipei. And um, she's a poet and she has illustrated this book uh, with photographs that she took during a stay she had in Taipei. And it's really, uh, really breathtaking. The, the lines of poetry and then the photographs really illuminate. They don't just depict what was in the poetry, but they give it another angle, take it further. I really enjoyed it. Um, and so she is going to um, show some of the, f read a bit and share some of the photos. So she'll give you a taste um, that way. Irene Chow. I'm just going to start at the beginning, and then Sherilyn yeah. is going to be like, stop. And, I'm like, stop. <laughs> and I actually can't read this small. So it's Walking alone at night, new in a strange city, I have more in common with the billboards than the legs that tap broken in whole tiles, easily transitioning from dark to light and back again. What was this place so heavy with eaves? Yes. Were these temples or markets? For a minute. Where there were faces, there were no hands. Where there were hands, there were no faces. Thank you. I could only make friends with the fishes. Taipei is a city remarkable for its grays. 10,000 varieties in the mixing of soot and rain, against which its multifarious colors jostle for prominence. The brightest of these is the temple. I realized one could learn to find space in the thin lane smoke avoids. Which is not so dim a space as you might have thought. Though some roads are only imaginary. In the water or in air. 
and the obstructions are both straight and solid. Slowly, I began to notice that color could come very close to the gray. It could be a messy but exciting way to live, though by no means natural. Some days, it seemed inevitable that I would always walk alone. That I should always stand aside and be an observer. Looking for, but never meeting, the gaze of others. At times, it seemed I was truly obsessed with the wrong things. Though doubtless, there is a pleasure in being very, very wrong. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there's a lot of places to write about, and they all have their different flavors, and there also are pitfalls in writing about certain places, cliches that go with them, um, and places also offer different inspirations. Um, you think about, um, you know, books set in India, you know, there's sort of a, a feeling there can be cliche, but there also can be um, inspiration that comes from that place. Um, Scandinavia, we have a lot of Scandinavian writers here, and the cold and, and you know, the chill and the crime fiction just comes out of there fabulously. So what is it about Taiwan that is a muse for each of you? And um, how about, uh, Shauna, would you mind starting? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I feel a personal connection to Taiwan because my mother is from Taiwan, um, but it is a place like that I'm in love with. And Joshua, I liked what you said yesterday. You said you had a crush on Taiwan, <laughs> and I feel like I have a crush on Taiwan too. Um, it's just like it's it's so lively. Um, there's so much going on there all the time. Um, the food has been mentioned, the food is really, the cuisine is really amazing. And I think there's also this spirit of resilience um, that is really inspirational too, considering the history of martial law and the dictatorship, um, that people are still so optimistic and you know, just the inauguration of um, their democratically elected female president just happened a week or so ago. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so I think it's an amazing place for all those reasons. How, um, how did it influence your, your writing? I mean, if you were to write about a different place, is there anything that is about the place that sort of informed the writing process itself, or was it just more the story was there? Well, I think the challenge was trying to capture all the threads of Taiwan's history in, into one narrative. Um, it's not a simple place. I mean, I guess there's no place that is simple, but it seemed particularly complicated and drawing in all the histories of colonialism and um, all the competing um, powers that want control of Taiwan and, and trying to negotiate that, um, I think, was uh, influenced the book because of having to negotiate all those different threads and in a way that was... Um, didn't play into stereotypes about Taiwan that represented it as its own place and distinguished it from the story of China as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had a you know, dissident character and a family that was there and then a woman who went to the US. So there's really a lot of ways that you were able to tell that story. Um, Ed, you talk a lot about, um, I learned a lot about the um, Aboriginal, Aborigines in Taiwan, which I didn't know that part, and um, all kinds of other uh, threads in the place. Um, can you tell us about how Taiwan has been your muse? Oh, um, let's see. Well, uh, I, I feel like, um, even though I was born in New York City, uh, I feel like I've been living with Taiwan my whole life. Uh, my, my mother's family uh, arrived in Taiwan as refugees from the Chinese Civil War. Uh, my father's family uh, are native Taiwanese. They've been there since 
the Ming Dynasty collapsed um, in the 1600s. And, uh, you know, these are like pretty much the two main opposition groups in Taiwan, like mainlanders versus, you know, Ben Shung, right? the, the real native Taiwanese as they see themselves. Uh, but as you mentioned, Sherilyn, you know, uh, the indigenous people uh, have, have the real claim to the island. Um, and uh, research, uh, you know, as the years progress, uh, re more and more research indicates that many of the Pacific Islanders um, including many of the uh, tribes uh, now settled in the Philippines islands, all originated in Taiwan. So Taiwan was sort of the gestation for all these, populating all these Pacific islands, um, which is one thing that distinguishes uh, Taiwan. Um, let's see. So um, as you know, as you may or may not know, um, the, um, Taiwan endured one of the longest martial law eras um, in, in modern civilization for, you know, 40 years, uh, a little bit longer than 40 years. And so there was this whole sort of thing when I was younger and going to Chinese school, which is sort of like this almost propagandic vehicle to, to indoctrinate you into believing that one day we will recover the mainland, right? Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these were actually very dangerous times in the 70s in the U.S. because the KMT, the Kuomintang, they had their secret agents infiltrated in all the Chinese and Taiwanese American communities. And they would re report any dissidents and your family back home would, would suffer uh, the consequences or you would be blacklisted and they would not be allowed to, to come to the U S. So once <laughs> it's really funny, once, <laughs> once martial law was lifted and, uh, the DPP was formally recognized as being a party that is legal to exist. My father was like, Taiwan must be free. Like it was like this new identity that emerged from him that he'd been suppressing for so long. Um, and so even my mother is like oh, now aboard with this thing, which is remarkable because her father was pretty high up in the Kuomintang. Um, so uh, the, this whole evolution that I, I've been with Taiwan has sort of infiltrated to you know my my core in a way. Uh, I had a previous series that was set uh, mysteries in in Manhattan's Chinatown, and in doing the research for that, I couldn't help but think about where I why I was here, why my family was here. And uh, it just led me on this whole path of, of research. Um, one thing that's really great is that Columbia University uh, has, has undertaken the task of translating a lot of contemporary Taiwanese uh, literature, uh, which is wonderful. In particular, I would uh, single out Orphan of Asia uh, by uh, Wu Zoliu. That's a great book. Um, and as a matter of fact, I made my narrator an orphan, you know, sort of symbolize, you know, Taiwan's status in, in not being a member of the United Nations. Um, it, even though it, it's sort of, uh, the modern Taiwan is sort of like the product of uh, three great cultures, you know, China, Japan, and the U.S. And I sort of feel like there's so many stories all intersecting on this small island that... Um, could very well prove to be a flashpoint for conflict. And conflict's a great place to be writing from. <laughs> That's right. Really interesting, interesting place, yeah. Um, okay, a place that engenders crushes. So, Joshua, you are the crushes person. Hi there. <laughs> and not only that, now I have a crush, but also now I'm a little bit jealous because maybe, you know, you love Taiwan more than me, and, you know, it's this weird thing. <laughs> This this is a common thing among like expats who live in Taiwan. No, Taiwan loves me more. Uh, a very good friend of mine who Taiwan definitely, definitely loves, my friend Phelan, came up with a, a line that I am dutifully going to steal from him, which is, um, Taiwan is where people who had bad childhoods go for a do-over. <laughs> and... I came to Taiwan, and I'm not going to get too into it, but typical American divorced family upbringing, and I moved to Taiwan when I was, you know, 24, not terribly mature, and um, immediately I found a family that took me in, and I was their, you know, atoa stepson, I was their foreign stepson, and I called them Mama and Baba with my broken Chinese, and they would call me down to eat, and they would say, 这是鸡肉, 鸡肉。Chicken, 
Oh, Jiro, xie xie. And they taught me how to speak uh, Chinese. And, uh, you know, they were kind of like this stable family that I lived with. And all of a sudden, you know, within three or four months, you know, I was living with this family and I had a purpose. Like, I was teaching this person English and this person, of course, never learned English, but that was okay because that was part of the reason that I was living there. And I was the guy in the neighborhood that people would come to to ask, Joshi, oh, this is a book. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, and so I had this purpose there. Now, as a writer, um, you know, I think Ed said it really well. He said that it's where these thousands of stories intersect. And I was thinking about this this morning. I've experienced every emotion that you can possibly feel while living on Taiwan, except for one. I have never felt bored in Taiwan. <laughs> um, and I mean, I literally, like, I've had nervous breakdowns on Taiwan that have, you know, required slight intervention, nothing, nothing terrible, but, you know, I wasn't bored during it. <laughs> and this is why I get so many stories. I have another book of short stories uh, that has a very long title, and the title is uh, How Not to Avoid Jet Lag and Other Tales of Travel Madness. Uh, anybody is going to write a book of short stories, go with less words. I'm just putting that right out there. It, doesn't, it takes up your whole Twitter hashtag. But um, I have a story in that about Taiwan that is called Your Least Fun Hour, and it is about an hour that I spent waiting in a bank. Yet this experience still was weird enough and had enough just strangeness. I was literally just waiting in a bank, but, you know, I can, I can send you the book if you want to read it. Uh, but it was so weird that I later went and I wrote a story about it. Um, every exchange, every experience that I have in Taiwan has that element of, wow, this is something that's really unique, whether it's taking a taxi from point A to point B, or um, running into a transvestite dressed up like the vice president in a, in a former political prison. Like, these things happen every day in Taiwan, and I, I don't know why. This doesn't happen to me in Portland, Oregon, which is where I currently live. I find life is a little bit dull there. And that's why Taiwan remains my muse, because um, it, it has never ceased to both entertain me, and it has never ceased to sort of use me as a channel for hopefully, you know, getting those stories out there. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Irene. Irene. I see you writing something. Can we interrupt you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always being interrupted when I'm doing something important. Are you writing? <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, so why, why Taiwan? How has Taiwan been your muse? How did you come to write this book? Oh, well, um, well, both my parents... Speak, speak up, yeah, thanks. Both my parents grew up there, um, and I kind of wanted to know more about my family history, so I had this opportunity to go teach in Taiwan for a year. Well, actually, it, was for, it could have been for longer if I'd wanted it to be longer, but, um, and I thought, you know, oh, I will go and experience this place that I've never known. I think I was looking for um, a history, and I and I. It, this is so cliche. I was looking for a history and an identity that I that didn't exist for me. Um, and much like my, I, I I don't know what I was expecting to find. I just would like pace the streets because I didn't know anybody. And um, it took me a very long time to realize that everything that was interesting that I could find was temporary, and everything that really is interesting to me about. Um, Taipei, which is where I was living, um, was sort of hidden away in a random alley. Um, I used to pass this dump all the time because I uh, also studied dance with Cloud, Cloudgate there. Um, and um, and they were in this little village called Bali. Um, and to get there, you had to, for a while, the way to get there was to, to cross through the dump. After a while, they closed that off. Um, <laughs> but it was like my favorite thing because I would walk by and every single day there would be something different there. Would, and then it would be there and then it would be gone. And that's sort of like the essence of, well, for one thing, photography. If you don't take the picture when you see it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I didn't have to... walk far to have the sense that things were always changing and there were always things to be discovered there. Um, also, um, never mind, I'll tell you later. 
Do tell us later. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's got to write something down. You can, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> you no. can go back to it. <laughs> um, so we've talked about place, um, this place in particular. And uh, the writer's tool book, of course, includes place and character and voice, this sort of elusive, magical voice, and plot, story. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to what comes first for you? I mean, some writers, it is the place that is the inspiration. Sometimes it's a phrase that comes to mind. Sometimes it's a... Um, a, you know, a particular character, um, or it's based on someone that you think, oh, I want to write about this and kind of explore it further. So um, how should we go here? I guess, Ed, what the heck? We'll talk about you, you first. Here. Okay, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do I start writing a story? Yeah, um, of those elements, does anything resound for you in that? Well, you know, uh, I know I have a, a, a relatively calm demeanor, but I'm a really <laughs> vengeful person. <laughs> Uh, and and I, I I come up with these if I feel like I've been wronged I, I come up with these ideas how can I get this guy back what can I do to to take down this bank that dares to charge me this fee for bouncing a check hmm hmm and and then that kind of drives me a, a little bit I mean I'm not like pure vengeance but that's it's like the initial sort of seed I mean it's it's very useful for mysteries. Um, <laughs> And I sort of feel like a mystery. There, there has to be a murder. There has to be, um, <laughs> there has to be a crime that there, there's no recall from. Like there just can't be like a, I don't know, twenty-three million dollar diamond heist. That's like that's just money, you know. There's, there's no blood in it really. Um, so that 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 is my main driving point. Um, and uh, you know, I, I primarily do novels. Um, I've always kind of seen short stories as, as being harder to work, but I became a father uh, slightly more than three years ago, and I've, I've been having these ideas for short stories that, that kind of lodge in my brain, and I have to write them out, otherwise I won't have the space to write the novels. So right now I've got about six or seven short stories, and I've been giving them boys' names, um, and I've, I've been reading them and stuff, but at some point maybe... I would collect them or something, but um, yeah, a, a lot of a lot of writing is really kind of unconscious. You know, it just kind of comes to you and just kind of grabs, like seizes you in the night, seizes me in the night. That that's how it works for me. And the new books are set. The stories are set where? Oh, uh, these the short stories are set basically in the U.S. In the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. The 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 novels are in uh, Taiwan. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Um, so we're talking about places and settings. Yeah, it just, I mean, you write, you write fiction. I write fiction, yeah, yeah. and I write nonfiction, and I write travel stories. I, I, I'm sort of a, like a, a Johnny on the spot for writing. Uh, my best ideas inevitably come to me in the shower, um, which means that I, and the thing is, it's, it's I sort of subscribe to uh, um, this idea that the muse will come and it will plant this thing into your mind, and if you don't do something with it quickly, it will the idea will go to somebody else. So you have to do something. It's like you have to honor the muse. But okay, write this down, and it could be like, all right, just write two paragraphs down, and then you can you can put that in the you know this is the next story box. But you have to write that down. Obviously, uh, if you don't jump on it pretty soon, it'll it'll flit away. But um, you know, for me, I write short stories, uh, probably about half the short stories I've written have been in Taiwan, but not, not all of them. Um, I mean, I, I've lived in Belize, like, but I've only written one short story about Belize, and it wasn't very good, so I guess Belize doesn't have the same pull for me. With, with Taiwan, the thing that's coming to mind is there's a theory in permaculture that the most fertile places are where two different ecosystems meet, like where, you know, where the forest ends and the grassland begins, that's like where you're going to have a very fertile area. And for me, Taiwan is where, and that's why I write about Taiwan, it's sort of where, I don't want to say it's where China ends and where something else begins, but it's this mixture. 
And because in so many different ways it's difficult to write about China for some, sometimes for political reasons, Taiwan can become a very good stand-in uh, for China. And the the novel that I'm now you know in the in the final stages of finishing. Um, it, it's basically about uh, an American um, cult leader who goes missing, and it is presumed that he has been kidnapped by the Chinese government for nefarious reasons. But in, fa he, in fact, he's in a, in a Taipei brothel uh, because he <laughs> ran up a bill that he couldn't pay. And it's a very tasteful brothel. It's more of a bathhouse, really, with a special area that you know you only go to if if you know you're cool. Um, and uh, in any event, I couldn't do that. It, it gives me a way to sort of um, write about Chinese stuff, but I couldn't set that in China because it just wouldn't make any sense. Uh, and that's why, you know, I feel like Taiwan's a really good place to write about Chinese stuff, but, you know, with also the freedom that you're actually, you know, not going to, like, get a knock on your door for writing about that. Or at least I haven't gotten a knock on my door yet uh, in Taiwan for writing about stuff. We'll see after this novel comes out uh, how much they really love me. But in any event, hey, yo. Is that it? Is that enough? No? Okay. All right. So, Shauna, um, your book is so rich and just covers so much time. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the story, actually, kind of give us an overview, and um, how, you, how you came into it. I mean, you said that there was a, a personal history you were exploring, but even with the writing itself, um, there was so much research involved, you know, creating these characters. Um, were they based on historical figures, or how, how did you develop it? It was such a mesmerizing book. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the story is set from 1947 to 2003, and it's narrated by this unnamed narrator who is born the night that um, this, this massacre begins, this famous massacre in Taiwan's history, the 228 massacre. And her father is arrested in the aftermath of that and is sent to Green Island, um, for, to the prison on Green Island for about a decade. And he comes back and the family has to, you know, uh, integrate him back into the life and he has to integrate back into to regular life too. But in the meantime, um, there's this implication that he's still being spied on and he's still being watched by the government and they're living under martial law at that point. And it follows the narrator as she like grows up and gets married and moves to the United States. And um, like Ed was saying, there were KMT agents in the U.S. who were also spying on, on Taiwanese Americans here. And so uh, she and her husband are, are also being watched and they get pulled into this um, kind of political plot. Um, so, I mean, I started, I think I started with the question why. I mean, there was a point... Um, I think there was a point when I, after I got through my adolescence, I, I looked at my mom and I was like, who is this person? Um, and I think we probably all have that moment where we realize our parents are people and then I, you know, we, <laughs> we want to figure out who they are and why they are the way they are. And um, I guess her, she seemed a little more distant to me because she had this just childhood that I didn't know about because she had grown up in Taiwan and I wasn't so familiar with it. So... Um, and I'd spent like my whole adolescence trying to be like the most stereotypical American girl I could, like obsessed with, I like wanted to be a Judy Bloom character. <laughs> it's just like fashioning my whole life around that. And then, yeah, and then I just woke up and I was like, wow, who is my mother and where, what is our history? So I moved to Taiwan and, um, and discovered this history and I was like, whoa, I can't believe that this was this whole life my mother had under martial law and, and this upbringing and I had no idea about it and she had never talked about it too. Uh, yeah, so I started, I started doing research. I moved to Taiwan for a few years. I um, just loved looking through old books and watching old movies and just trying to pick out the details. Like, I think the moment I discovered that taxi cabs were red you know, not yellow, and I'm like, that's an important detail. So just getting those little, little, putting those little pieces together. Um, and then the the Taiwanese Americans in the Bay Area were were really amazing too. Um, I interviewed a lot of people, and um, there's an organization run out of Berkeley, TaiwaneseAmerican.org, which is awesome. And the founder. Um, introduced me to a lot of the older generation who talked about their experiences being blacklisted and spied on in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she has an interesting dissident character who moves, um, who ends up in, should I say, would this give things away? Maybe no I shouldn't spoilers. say. 
What? No spoilers. But <laughs> but the spoilers. the crazy thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. But the crazy thing about that character is it's based on a real person who lived mm-hmm. in Daly City, mm-hmm. who. Um, okay. Which this is not a spoiler. This is a historical fact. Has n- it's not connected to my book at all, okay. except based on this actual person who was murdered in Daly City by KMT um, agents on U.S. soil, who was an American citizen, which is insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Irene, which comes first, the photo or the poetry? Uh, well. I mean, I just always keep a camera in my pocket. I, mm-hmm. Everyone does this now because you all have phones that do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think actually back then people could have phones that did this too. But um, so as I walk around, I just, I'm usually taking pictures as I'm moving. Hmm. And um, I, oh, sorry, sorry, what are you asking? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so, Poetry, so, pr- yeah. Oh, so I, I never planned to do, well, I planned to write a different book, right? I planned to write my family history, which I just, made no progress on whatsoever. I don't know how I, I like expected to just uh, absorb it from the place. Um, mm-hmm. So, but instead um, I just took all these notes with my camera. Um, and I had an aunt there who was like, oh, you should print a book of your photos. And I was like, no, I put them on Facebook. That's enough. Um, and, um, but she took me to a, a printer. And for the first, he, so I had to make a little selection and then uh, he printed out little prints and it was the first time I'd ever had hard copies of my photos, so I started like sorting them because I've also been to Germany and they like to sort things there. Um, and when I started like sorting, I realized I had an, a story. Um, so actually, the words just, I put it all together in like two days um, wow. because I wasn't thinking about the words at all. They were just so other people would see the same story that I was seeing. Mm-hmm. They're captions. Great. It reads like poetry, you know, caption Thank poetry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wanted to turn to questions at this point anyway. So try to see. Okay, lady with her hand up. Yes. Speak up, please. Joshua, when you said that Taiwan was a good standing for China, mm-hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Midwest girl, even though I love Asia. But I was thinking, would the Taiwanese people feel? You know, I was like, whoa, this seems like a big statement to say here. Uh, 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 it's uh, my Taiwanese friends. What do you think? Uh, I, I won't answer that question. Taiwan ran, you think that Taiwan is not a good stand in? Could you just say that in the world? What do you think? Did I say that wrong? Do you think yes or no? Uh, so I think oftentimes people will say that Taiwan has sort of preserved traditional Chinese culture. Um, in a way that um, <coughs> China has not because of the cultural revolution. Yeah, that 10 years where they went around destroying all of their culture. Um, Oops. Um, but, but I also think that, you know, um, after um, the Taiwan Republic and the majority of people who lived in Taiwan, you know, have become, um, their families arrived there before, long before. Um, before 1949. Long, long before 1949, you know, in the 17th century, as I was saying. And so, in many ways, I think Taiwan, the situation of Taiwan is sort of analogous to um, the same sorts of colonial in, um, history of Taiwan. It's like, it was discovered, quote, unquote, at the same time the New World was, quote, sure. quote, discovered. And so we would never say that there's, you know, no such thing as American culture. Right. America's sort of stand in for this European history. But I also understand when, what you were getting at. When I, when I, when I say as a stand in, um, what I mean is, for example, if I were going to film a shot that was supposed to be, you know, um, Guangzhou in 1920, you know, I could pick a neighborhood in Taipei that kind of looks like that, and everybody, well, this isn't right because they would be speaking Cantonese in Guangzhou, let's say Shanghai in 1920 instead, and it would look around the same, and it would feel around the same, and you could get a similar feeling. Um, So that's more or less what I mean. I didn't mean stand in as in exactly the same, because I think that there has been a great divergence. Did that answer your question? Partially? Well, I was wondering, as an identity. That's a big can of worms. 
And uh, it's a big, big, big can of worms. And I, I'd be happy to talk after this uh, about that. And I write about that. But um, yesterday, for example, I, I, I'm, I studied philosophy in school, so I can, I can answer your question with a question, uh, which is, well, what is, what is American identity? See, and you can't, like, Make that's... Make America great again. No, no, let's... <laughs> oh, oh I, I've been trying to block that out of my brain. Okay. Somebody, somebody said a couple days ago, let's get hats saying, make America Berkeley again. Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it, it, Taiwan identity is a huge mixture. It's a big potpourri of a lot of different things. But Chinese is still, it's, it's one of the more dominant ones. I don't think anybody would argue that. So, um, and all the best art is there because they didn't, like I said, destroy all their art in 1966. All right, next. Great, next question. I, I just want to put it out there that... Um, the new president that was just sworn in, uh, her her uh, grandmother, so she's one quarter uh, from the Aboriginal... Bunan, I believe she is Bunan, am yeah. I correct? Uh, oh, Taiwan? Taiwan, Taiwan. Taiwan, yeah. So so it's she represents, I think, a new dawn, yeah. a, lot, a lot of new things. She's also a cat lover. <laughs> yeah. Way in the corner. Back, yeah. Well, uh, I think we have to think about what day it is today, right. June 4th. Exactly. Something happened on June 4th a number of years ago. I mean, that was a huge departure point. Um, and uh, I think about the young people in Taiwan born after that date and, and looking at uh, the response in Tiananmen and just thinking about how, you know, <laughs> that's so savage, uh, a civilization that they are not really a part of. I Oh, no, I no. just wanted to show off my anti-tank shirt, um, <laughs> which actually this is an authentic one from my friend from Israel who's a conscientious objector. Um, but uh, I, I was thinking about like these small zones that China wants to claim um, and how they've had to set themselves up as zones of resistance or like zones of actually freer speech. Um, and this is something, I, I loved that comment by, I don't know you, but... Y you over there, <laughs> about how like ta Taiwan needs to sort of decathect from its like history with China, but it, it can't, right? It, it's gone through these phases. It has like Dutch beer, although that has nothing to do with its politics, right? But, um, or maybe it does. I mean, isn't Formosa, never mind. <laughs> the more I talk, the more I'll, I'll reveal like my mm. appalling lack I of history. One more thing to yeah. say. Yeah. It's, it's my, one of my least, uh, my most deeply unpopular opinions, but I keep saying it. Um, Are we going to have I'll, a class fight? Because I'll never learn. Um, yes. I, in some ways, just as you know, when, when China absorbed Hong Kong, and then all of a sudden the financial system of Hong Kong actually kind of, for better or worse, took over China, pretty much effectively ended communism. I see in Taiwan as a, a Trojan horse, and when I see mainland people coming to Taiwan, because that's, you know, my main thing is tourism, and they're in Taiwan, like, wait a minute, why is it that these people who look like us and they speak our language, why can they criticize their government and not get shot? Why is it that they're allowed to print all these things in their newspapers and we can't? Why do they have all these political parties and we don't? If we're all one people, well, why don't we deserve this? Because one of the main disservices that I think that the Chinese Communist Party does is that they say, well, Chinese people can't handle democracy. It will be Luan Chi It will be chaos if there's ever democracy in China. But then they can look in Taiwan and say, no, they they have democracy. They are able to settle their disputes in a peaceful way. They were able to go from authoritarianism to a democracy without, you know, heads getting chopped off. And I kind of think that in some ways, and, and if you're Taiwanese and you disagree, I'm okay with that. It might be partially a responsibility that Taiwan has to hold up a torch, if that makes any sense, you know, and 
it's it maybe a tough cross to bear, but I think it's happening right now. So there. Irene, do you want to say something more? Or oh, we should, I just want, oh, sorry. No, we should go to another I, question. I just wanted to add that I, I find it most fascinating that the reason why people come is, is for the tourism. Like they want to see the jade cabbage, or, you know, oh. like, <laughs> want, yeah. like it's, it, but it's the works of art that draw them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the jade cabbage is so boring. I know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but I have heard the, the art is gorgeous. Don't, don't see yeah. the jade cabbage. Okay, except for the see jade the cabbage. cabbage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. There is better. But One see writer the jade says, okay, we have a, we had a couple arms up, so hands up.